This is a human. This is the composition of the human body. This is essentially what we are trying to make. We growers of food. This kind of swirling configuration of dusty cloud we call a human being. Now, the cool thing is, we humans are mostly made out of <sighs> carbon dioxide and water, so that's fairly easy. We just need to use sunlight energy to take the diluted and unordered molecules of air and water and organize them into neat little packets of sugar, fat, and protein. Oh, actually, we can't make the protein just yet because that requires nitrogen. But we can stitch together the bulk of what constitutes a human. Well, obviously we can't do it, being animals and all, but we can at least help orchestrate this process. We stitch together the bulk of what constitutes a human being using plants. Photosynthesis and all that magical transformation stuff. Plant flesh made out of fresh air and raindrops. Next, the nitrogen bit we also get from the air, thank goodness, but this time it's the bacteria doing the magic trick, turning atmosphere into ammonium, or the kind of nitrogen that plants can actually absorb. Now, the plants and the bacteria each have essential bits of being alive that the other needs, and so they trade. The plants give the bacteria sugar so they can have energy to, you know, to bacteria stuff, divide or whatever, and the bacteria give nitrogen to plants so that they can make proteins and DNA. Everybody wins. That's 96% of the composition of the human body made right there on site, made out of rain clouds and breezes, without importing a single ounce of anything. No trucks, no fossil fuels, no pollution, just daily sunlight, green leaves, and pink bacteria. Make sure they're pink, you want to be sure they're working. Generally, we want to perform this wondrous trick as fast as we possibly can, on account of having so many mouths to feed. So, we use super fast growing plants that are really really good at making living cells out of thin air. Pioneer plants, we call them. These are plants that don't need coddling. They don't need lush, airy loam or constant pre-programmed drip irrigation. These plants don't need our help. We need their help. These are the plants that make the food, that feeds the soil, that fertilizes the farm, that feeds us. Generally, you can think about them in two categories, which can and do overlap. The nitrogen fixers, and the biomass plants, and dynamic mineral accumulators. Now, in order to accelerate this process, by which inanimate particles are turned into people, we have to orchestrate the system a little bit. Because face it, none of the other species really want to feed us. They want those previously mentioned particles to turn into baby hickory trees or Haas avocados, not baby homo sapiens. So we have to make them share. More on this in a moment. Luckily, there is usually enough air and water to go around. However, the next little wee bit of the human being is a bit more tricky. That tiny little bit of rock dust that is only 4% of the composition of the human, about 6 pounds on average, about a bag of sugar's worth at any given moment, that we can't get from the air. We have to get it from the soil. Potassium, phosphorus, calcium, etc., all that good stuff essentially has to be mined. And even though this is just a relatively small component of the body, this dust is really, really important. For teeth and bones and the whole electrical nervous system running your brain and allowing you to move about athletically or sit quietly and watch presentations, this is the kind of stuff that is absolutely silly to let leave your property. In a forest, these minerals are tightly cycled, getting passed about from one body to another. Mulberry to mushroom to beetle to bobcat to bacteria back to mulberry. Insert yourself into this loop and all is golden. But hey, you are all farmers. So by default, you are exporting your priceless bone and brain dust when you sell food grown on your land for people to eat somewhere that is not on your land. It's a predicament not entirely obvious when we have giant machines burning 31,000 calories in a gallon of gasoline to either mine or move vast quantities of minerals across vast distances. The ideal, of course, would be to cycle all your minerals within your local community. 
farm soil into farm food into local communities and back to farm soil. But that is going to take some doing. In the meantime, what can we do to minimize the potential problems of strip mining a soil's minerals while at the same time not utilizing more than our fair share of daily sunlight in order to return the good dust back into our habitat's living loop? Deep Roots Long-lived perennial species like trees and certain grasses are able to access more of the soil horizon and thus access more soil minerals than shallow-rooted species. Flying and crawling things. You can import rock dust by trading with mobile creatures. Provide habitat for insects, birds, amphibians, and the occasional flying mammal, and they will trade you for these perks of food, water, and living spaces in exchange for tidy little packets of concentrated minerals. Dynamic mineral accumulators. Some plant species are more adept than others at extracting minerals from raw soil rock. These are your mineral accumulator plants. These plants are your biological mining crew, extracting minerals from the soil and hyperaccumulating them in their tissues for convenient access. Fungi. A good portion of plants form relationships with beneficial fungi called mycorrhizae. It's similar to the relationship that nitrogen-fixing plants have with nitrogen-fixing bacteria, except in this case, plants trade sugar for minerals. I would guess that most dynamic mineral accumulators are pretty good friends with fungi. And if you want to keep your soil fungi hyphae nice and intact and roaming through the ground in search of rock dust to make bioavailable, try not to till the soil so much, as this tends to shred them. Cation Exchange Capacity Simply put, the CEC is the soil's ability to hold on to nutrients. You want a soil that is really good at catching nutrients before they run off, yet not so sticky as to make those nutrients unavailable to plant roots. Florida sugar sand has a horrible CEC, while carbon-rich humus is just about perfect. You don't have to store minerals in non-living humus, though. I think an even better place to store minerals is in living bodies. So try to keep your soil alive at all times. The more diversity and the more numbers of living beings on your site, the more minerals you are holding on to. Orchestrating farm fertility, or making humans out of thin air, water, and a dash of dust with pioneer plants. Plant nitrogen-fixing trees that are able to be coppiced on the crummiest soil on your site. This soil is usually found at a high point on your property, because gravity. The more nitrogen the soil already has, the less nitrogen the nitrogen-fixing bacteria bother to fix. In rich soils, this could actually end up removing nitrogen from the soil instead of adding to it. Plant dynamic mineral accumulator biomass plants in a spot that receives a surplus of nutrients, particularly the soil minerals like phosphorus and potassium, but they are also usually good at mopping up non-gaseous nitrogen before it has a chance to return to the atmosphere. This is usually going to be a low spot on your property, because gravity. Make the pioneers share the wealth by chopping them and feeding them to the less advantaged but more edible human food plants. Try not to cut them down entirely, but instead keep them at that sweet spot of fastest growth between immaturity and senescence. Oddly, cutting back these particular plants tends to keep them metabolically young. Eat the food, repeat the process. The more you repeat this process, the more carbon gets stored in the soil. The more carbon stored in the soil, the more cation exchange capacity. The more the soil is able to hold on to additional nutrients. The soil springs to life. Now nutrients are held in living bodies as well as in the carbon. Bacteria, fungi, earthworms, and tardigrades live, multiply, and die with their bodies feeding the plants that feed us. Everyone lives well-fed and happy lives. This process works just fine for the 96% of the human that we can make out of air. It will even work fine for the soil-derived 4% for a period of time. 
But as long as we are exporting food, sooner or later we will have mined our last bit of essential minerals and shipped them off site. Sometime in the not too distant future, we are probably going to have to stop using giant fossil fuel powered machinery to mine mountains and ecosystems for our minerals. We are probably even going to have to stop industrially producing bone meals, kelp meals, and blood meals, and shipping those mineral-laden powders vast distances in giant semi-trucks. We are going to have to learn how to recycle our minerals in tight loops like wild forests do, inside our local communities. Lucky for us, the minerals are infinitely reusable. We can run the same phosphorus through a clump of vetiver, into a fungus, into a persimmon tree, into a human, and back into some vetiver. This is what life has been doing for billions of years, turning rock dust into the animated rock dust we call life. It's a mind-bogglingly amazing process that is probably the closest thing I've ever seen to real magic. And it really wants to happen. We just have to let it happen. Or, if we wanted to, we could help accelerate the process. We could be active participants in orchestrating the processes by which life makes more life. Growing plants that feed the soil, that grows the species, that feed the humans. Who do what they can to help with this. Highly collaborative, magical, complicated, cycling process of making the world more alive.